Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're gonna look at this server right here, which is the Supermicro Sys51T-MR. Now this Supermicro server is definitely not their highest end server, and really that's not the point. Instead, this is the Xeon E 2300, which is Rocket Lake E for the server market, in a 1U server. Now this type of server is not necessarily you know, gonna be running like Intel Optane persistent memory and have like terabytes of memory. Instead, what it's designed for is a very low cost, but high frequency per core node. And we've been reviewing products on the STH main site in this segment, I think since like 2000, I don't know, nine or 10 or something like that. So we've been certainly, you know, well-versed in the segment. And this is kind of one of those ones that there are definitely some things that I think are really, really good. And there are other things I kind of wish that were a little bit better that Intel didn't necessarily provide, but I'm gonna get into those in a second. And one other really cool part of the system is that this is a Supermicro X12 STH motherboard. And so just a really quick note, Supermicro did send the system, like uh, they've sent systems for years for us to just go and try out for a little bit and just review. Uh, Supermicro of course has no editorial control and nobody ever gets any editorial control. We always get to own all editorial content on STH. And so just know that that's just kind of how we operate as standard, but I am gonna mark this video as sponsored because they did loan us a system. And you might be thinking to yourself, Patrick, is this just some kind of green screen trickery? And it's absolutely not. I've gotten a lot of feedback on the fact that I've been holding up a lot of things on camera just with the new set, since we don't necessarily have the same table setup that we used to have. And well, one of the things that I had this idea because I'm taking that flack is like, well, you know, we have the structure that's above me and that whole structure can support something like, you know, a couple thousand pounds per beam because it's, you know, F34 trussing. And I was like, well, I wonder if we could take safety cables and actually go, you know, just hang a server. And this one is particularly pretty light and it turns out that, yeah, it totally works. So you can see it will swing. So the game plan is let's go look at the hardware and really go from the front of the system to the back of the system. And we'll take a look at all the inside stuff and then talk a little bit about performance. And then we'll finally get to some final words and just thoughts about the system. All right, so let's start with the front of the system. And what you're gonna see is that we have a total of four three and a half inch hard drive bays. Now these four three and a half inch hard drive bays are certainly not necessarily there for like, you know, the highest density SSD, but in this segment of the market, it is very, I guess, common that you'll see one or two SSDs, and then maybe you'll see one or two hard drives as well. This is really, you know, these things are extremely popular in things like the dedicated hosting markets and stuff like that, where these kind of lower power, lower cost servers are just popular. And so that's kind of the configuration on the front. Now, if you do want to go put a two and a half inch hard drive or SSD, what you can do is get an adapter, which we actually have in the system. And you can see that we actually have a two and a half inch hard drive with an adapter in one of these three and a half inch base. So you can totally go and either get capacity two and a half inch, you could get SSDs, you could put capacity three and a half inch. There's a whole bunch of different things that you can do in this chassis. And if you had a two and a half inch chassis, you would not be able to put three and a half inch drives. So you kind of have to make a choice. And that's why you commonly see this kind of four by three and a half inch drive front. So the other thing that you can see on the front of the system, if you look above the drives, is you actually can see that there is a slot for a slim optical drive. And so you could have like a DVD writer or reader or something like that in one of those slots uh, if you really wanted it. I guess it's not really that common these days, but in this segment, there are people that I guess are using optical media and want that, but it's not a standard feature because it's just not that common anymore. One thing that we should note though, is that this is not a backplane that can support, you know, three and a half inch, two and a half inch, uh, you know, SATA SAS, and then also support NVMe. This is really a most likely gonna be used with SATA. You may put a SAS card in there and we're gonna explain and show a little bit of a kind of cool feature for that in a little bit, but most likely I think a lot of these systems are gonna be SATA systems. And before we get to the inside, let's get to the rear of the system. And there you can see a pretty typical, I mean, this is definitely a super micro configuration that we've seen for a long time. You have an out of band management port, you have USB two ports, so a pair of USB two ports, you have a pair of USB three ports. You also have a VGA port, a serial COM port. And then the final feature that I guess is the big one uh, is that, well, while you see the single block of the dedicated management port, there are also two gigabit ethernet controllers on this as well. These one GBE controllers are actually Intel i210 controllers. So they're not using, you know, kind of either the integrated NICs or like, you know, Realtek NICs or anything like that. These are at least, you know, pretty decent one gigabit ethernet mix. So that is certainly available. If you do want higher speed networking, I guess the idea is that you would go and add that on separately. I know in this generation, people are looking a lot more at things like the X550 
and other like controllers that can do 10G base T, but that does add cost and adds power consumption. So I kind of get why if you're gonna go for a cost optimized system, you would totally go do this. Now in the back of the system, the other big features that you're gonna see are, well, the power supplies, and you're also gonna see the riser ports. So let's talk about the riser slots at least first. And what you're gonna see is this actually area right here is where the riser is. And there are two slots here. Now one is a full height slot and you can get an X16 or by 16 PCIe gen four slot. Uh, over there. And then on the other side, you have a by eight slot that can go in a low profile slot. Now I do want to be just very clear here that you cannot use both of these at full speed. You can either run a 16 and zero, or you can run an eight and eight configuration, but you can't run like a 16 plus eight configuration because Rocket Lake E just doesn't have that many PCIe lanes to be able to support something like that with the rest of the configuration that's here. Now, in terms of the power supplies, you'll notice that we call this the 510T-MR, that R stands for redundant. And so we have redundant power supplies. Specifically, we have two 400 watt 80 plus platinum power supplies. These are actually pretty high end, I mean, at least high efficiency PSUs, especially for this segment. This is still a segment that, you know, seeing bronze or gold PSUs is not totally uncommon. So it is kind of nice that, you know, this is kind of a little bit greener, I guess. So if you wanted a green, low power server, then I guess it's better that you have platinum power supplies and you do have redundancy so you can run AMB power into the system. But if you don't want redundant power, I would probably suggest like just go and get the M version instead of the MR version because you don't need the redundant power supplies and you save a couple bucks. All right, so let's get inside the system because this is not the biggest system, but on the other hand, it is super cool and I'm getting really excited because we're getting close to the motherboard now. The first thing that you're gonna notice uh, behind the back plane for the storage up here is you're actually gonna notice that we do have a fan array. Now in our particular system, only four of the six fans are actually populated or fan slots are populated. You could add another fan if you, you know, totally wanted to. We have blanks in here instead. Uh, and that's just how Supermicro actually sent this to us. And one thing to note is just one U fans are typically, especially kind of in this segment, are very hard to, you very rarely find like true hot swap fans like you find on a lot of the two U servers. Instead, usually there are cables just due to the actual, I guess, depth of the chassis in a one U is just not tall enough to support normal hot swap fans like we would normally see them. And so this does not have that, but it does have a kind of cool feature that you can actually pull out this entire fan partition all in one go. It's on little rubber grommets for vibration dampening, but you just pull it out and you can start servicing it. So while this is not hot swap fans like you normally see in kind of higher end servers, it is still a pretty decent solution, especially in this segment. Now, you know, I've been waiting the entire video to get to this. This server actually uses the Supermicro X12 STH dash sys motherboard. And this is a single socket Rocket Lake E, so Xeon E2300 series motherboard. But let's kind of go over some of the kind of cool features because there are definitely some unique things on this motherboard other than the fact that it just says STH and it just makes me really excited that it does. Specifically, let's start with the memory. You can see that we have four DDR4 slots and these are DDR4 3200 slots. You get dual channel memory like we've gotten in this generation since before the Xeon E3. I mean, the X, uh, 3000 series that definitely had dual channel memory. I mean, there's definitely been DDR uh, dual channel memory in this segment for just like forever, right? But while you have dual channel memory, you can actually run two DIMMs per channel. And that means that if you wanna go put 32 gig DIMMs in there and get a total of 128 gigabytes in the system, you can totally go do that. A lot of these systems are gonna be deployed with a lot less, something like, you know, 16, 32, 64 gigs. And so those configurations are probably a little bit more common, but at the same time, you can actually get a decent amount of memory, especially if you have like an eight core CPU. Okay, so next, let's get to this heatsink because I immediately noticed that this thing looks a little bit weird. And the reason it looks a little bit weird is that the mounting pattern for this is not necessarily kind of the symmetric design that we are typically used to. It's actually offset. So the fins are actually offset a little bit more towards the, I guess, memory side rather than towards the PCIe expansion side. And that is really there and I think it's there at least in order to provide enough room to actually put expansion slots because you have redundant power supplies that take up a lot of room and you know you only have so much width in a rack mount chassis. So I guess that's why that was made like that, but it just kind of looks funny that the four mounting screws are actually not symmetrical or like not evenly spaced in this heatsink. I don't know why, I just kind of thought that that's kind of fun. Other big features with the X12 STH is that we do get an internal USB 3 header. We also have a front panel header, although that's not being used in this system. You'll see the storage, which is kind of up here. And what you'll actually see is that we get two gold SATA ports. And those are really for SATA DOMs. They can power SATA DOMs without having that little annoying 
sorry, I don't want to say it's annoying, but it is annoying to actually go place a SATA DOM power connector. And so it's just way easier if you can use the power SATA DOMs in here. I just think that that's way better. There's another two seven pin SATA ports, but then this system, because we're mostly focused on the three and a half inch bays, we actually have a higher density cable that is providing all of that band or all that connectivity to the front panel. What that also means though, is that we can use those gold ports. Plus we can use the four uh, front drive bays and actually get a total of, you know, like redundant boot SATA DOMs. Plus we can have four drives in the drive bays and there's a little bit more that we can do with this system as well. We'll get to that in a sec. Now, just below that, it's gonna be a little hard to see here. There's this little silver heat sink that's over here. And what that really is, is that's the Intel C256 PCH. And so you can run both the Xeon E2300 series, but there are also some Pentium models that you can run in here. You do lose some uh, kind of big features like PCIe Gen 4, and you also lose, uh, I think like memory speed and stuff like that if you use a Pentium thing. But I guess some people will certainly use the low end Pentium ones uh, in these systems. But frankly, I think the Xeon E series is probably where I would go. There's some nice new models here. And so I would totally get the Xeon E2300 series in the system. Now, the other big feature that you're gonna see here is that we get an M.2 22110 or M.2 .2 which is 110 or 80 millimeter SSD or M.2 SSD slot here. What that basically means is that you can use not just kind of consumer type drives that don't have power loss protection, but also the larger 110 millimeter drives that actually can fit power loss protection. Actually, that little bit of extra PCB space makes a big difference and why you can have that. In servers, you might want a PLP SSD. And if so, this actually can support it, which is nice, especially in this kind of lower end of the market segment. Now, by this point, you probably have noticed that there's this extra little slot that's right here. And that is an internal PCIe slot. Specifically, that slot is, I think, a by four PCIe Gen 3 slot that goes to the PCH. And why it's kind of, in this orientation is we actually pulled off in some of the the you know photos of b-roll you actually see what's going on here and the basic idea is that you know in a one-u chassis you don't really have that much room and so by having this little slot like this you could put a low profile card and that low profile card can be like a sas controller so if you want to have like a four drive raid controller or hba for like sas or just raid you can actually put that in here and you don't use up your pcie gen 4 higher speed port just at the end of the day, you don't need that much bandwidth for four rotating uh, hard drives. And so having a kind of way to have hardware rate right in here and not use up one of those valuable PCIe slots, I think is awesome. And this is actually similar to one of the features that you see in, I guess, Supermicro, like kind of their higher end, like ultra servers and stuff like that. There actually is a slot in a lot of those ultra servers in the middle of the chassis where you can actually go put a SAS controller so you don't have to use the, I guess, IO expansion on the rear of the system. And so it just kind of gives you an extra slot basically by orienting something like this, but this is kind of a lower end system. So it's not necessarily something that you would expect to see that. And oh, by the way, this middle low profile file expansion slot that we showed on the riser, that also is a common place for 1U and 2U super micro servers to have a network controller. And so there actually usually is a low profile slot on the higher end systems from Supermicro there. So you can just kind of see that design language carry through from, I guess, the high end of the Supermicro portfolio to the Xeon E2300 series, which is really kind of more of an entry option. One other big change in this generation is that this uses the A-Speed AST2600 BMC. And that is the new version. So in the previous generations for the last couple of years, we've been seeing the A-Speed AST2500. And this is just the newer generation. It's a little bit faster. And so Supermicro is able to go and rev their entry server to what their, I guess, Ice Lake and those kind of servers, what those use the kind of newer generation of BMC. All right, so let's talk a little bit about performance and power consumption. So Rocket Lake E, and just kind of at a high level, uh, is a, a pretty interesting series actually, because what you do get is you get basically the same thing that we saw at launch in 2021 or earlier in 2021 on the desktop. And that's, you know, Rocket Lake E. So that does bring features like PCIe Gen 4 that are absolutely awesome and needed in this segment, because frankly, PCIe Gen 3 in this segment's a little bit old. And, you know, having PCIe Gen 4 in a system like this allows you to do some pretty wild things. Like, for example, this is a brand new Intel E810 dual 100 gigabit ethernet controller. And you can totally run one of these out of the by 16 PCIe Gen 4 slot that's in this system. So that is something that is new in this generation of systems. And I think that's absolutely awesome. Now, of course, we are gonna have a review of this 100 gig ethernet NIC in a little bit. 
But I just wanted to kind of showcase that this new system in Rocket Lakey enables that PCIe Gen 4, which it also enables a whole new ecosystem of peripherals that you just couldn't use with the previous generation because they just didn't have enough PCIe bandwidth. And the other change that Intel really has in this versus the desktop Rocket Lake E, uh, aside from the ECC memory support, which is definitely a big one in a server platform like this, but there's also a different TDP range. So this, these CPUs really range from about 65 watts up to I think 95 watt TDP. And while that means that you don't necessarily have the thermal headroom and the power headroom to go and boost clocks and keep clocks as high as you would have on the desktop parts, it also means that these chips tend to run a lot cooler than their desktop counterparts. So that is, I guess, a definite benefit if you're in a one use server system like this. Now we're gonna do a little bit deeper dive in terms of performance of this on the STH main site soon, but just in terms of performance, you definitely do see a generational improvement that we're gonna show here. And that's just with some quick benchmarks, just to kind of just show you just a relative improvement, which makes sense. We've already done a lot of, you know, Rocket Lake E already. So, you know, I think that's a pretty well-known quantity at this point, but just kind of showing you what it is. So the other thing I really wanna get into real quick is just power, because it really does matter in this segment. And just giving you some idea of why it matters in the segment, a very popular low, low end co-location offering in North America, at least, is that you get like one amp of power at 110, 120 volts. And so this type of system was actually, if you were to go to like those kind of co-location providers, the Xeon E series or the Xeon E3 series before that, those were extremely popular. And the reason was that for a lot of uh, a lot of the history of the Xeon E3, you could actually basically just kind of load those systems up and they wouldn't actually go over say 120 watts. This system, when you do have a 95 watt TDP CPU, can certainly go over 120 watts. So it is something that you have to keep in mind when you go load this system up, especially if you have drives and you have you know full memory configuration like we have here. Maybe you have some high-speed PCIe Gen 4 devices and HBA, whatever it is, if you start adding a lot of devices to it, you will most likely go over that 110 to 120 watt range. So overall, I actually really like the server. And I'm gonna admit I am 100% completely biased. If you make a motherboard in your server or a server that says STH, I am immediately going to like it a lot more than other servers just because it actually says STH. But at the same time, we have been reviewing systems in this segment for Supermicro and other vendors for just like a decade or more. And this is certainly a nice evolution of the series. I would like to see some more cores, I think, in this generation or in this series. Uh, and I think that will come. It's just in this generation, Intel is kind of in the kind of like pre-Alder Lake generation. And so I think that's just kind of what we're getting. But the Xeon E series, even though they're basically the same cores as the desktop series, they tend to lag in terms of their introduction by several months. And so it's something that you know, I would say that we are going to see a future generation, of course, of the entry level Xeon because they've been, you know, doing servers in this market for years. But at the same time, it's probably going to be a while until we see that. And so I actually am kind of excited about the 2300 series. I think there are a lot of folks that see some of the high end systems that we do and say, well, those are cool, but I don't necessarily need something that, you know, is going to use. 500 watts or a thousand watts or something like that, or even more like five kilowatts or more that we've been testing lately. And so a system like this, where, you know, you're running at, you know, one amp at 120 volts and you can put in inexpensive co-location is something that, you know, I think is actually kind of cool. And while we've really focused on that, you know, 110, 120 watt range for that kind of low end co-location, of course, if you have higher end racks, it just means that you can have very dense systems in those racks. And that's not necessarily something that you can say with the very high end systems and a lot of racks that are out there today, just because the power consumption on the high end systems is just growing at such a huge rate that you know systems like this actually still allow you to get a lot of density while adding more performance and features. So hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this look at the Supermicro Sys 510T-MR with the Supermicro X12 STH motherboard. And hey, if you did like this video, well, why don't you give us a like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.